ok c'è ancora la ecco però questo ok Uno, uno è il suo, sì. il portale, sì. l'altro è il suo. Ok, ok, questo è chiuso. Sì. Si riesce a togliere il microfono? Si sente da così adesso la casa? Sì, confermo. No, Perfetto, grazie mille. Ci siamo. In, eh, a breve faccio l'introduzione. Bene, direi che uh, possiamo cominciare. So, welcome everybody here in the room and uh, on, online. It's a true honor to present Professor Tommaso Poggio, Eugene Metternot Professor at MIT, co-director of the Center of Brains, Minds and Machines, co-founder scientific advisor of the MIT Quest for Intelligence, member of the McGovern Institute of Computational Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, Brain and Science Department, MIT. I will just spend a few words of introduction. Professor Tormaggio Poggio is one of the founders of computational neuroscience. He pioneered the, de the development of models in the visual system of flies and human stereo vision. He gave fundamental contribution to the biophysics of computation and learning theory. He received an impressive number of international recognitions and awards for his outstanding and transdisciplinary research. I would just like to mention one, the laurea honoris causa in Ingegneria Informatica for the Bicentenario dell'Invenzione della Pila in Pavia in uh, year 2000. To illustrate the significant influence that Professor Poggio had on artificial intelligence, I would like just to mention two facts. Demis Asabis, CEO and co-founder of DeepMind, is one of his, of his former postdocs, and for this reason, he witnessed in person the famous, uh, uh, let's say, match between AlphaGo and Lissedol in Seoul, where artificial intelligence defeated the best human player in the complex game Go. So it's a very true honor to have to Professor Poggio here. The floor is yours. Thank you, Paolo. Um, it's great to be here, Politecnico. First time I come to Mox, for sure. It's nice to see it. all of you here. Um, let's see, I've been... Uh, um, I've been between computers and brains for the last 40 years. Online, they don't have slides, but we have solo la the cosa of Zoom. Ah. Qua? Yeah. Perfect. Chiudo anche il microfono, questo? No, questo no. Scusa. So I was saying for the last 40 years or so, I've been um, working between, between uh, brains and computers because um, my interest was about intelligence. What is it? How to recreate it, reproduce, reproduce it in machines, possibly how to improve it so that we could uh, if we solve or make progress on the problem of intelligence, we could then solve uh, all other great problems in science. Um, so that, was, that has been the dream. And uh, I want to tell you about uh, what's happening now. Of course, the last five years have been uh, pretty exciting in terms of progress in uh, um, 
systems that now can be said to be probably as intelligent as we are, given or taken. Uh, systems like ChatGPT. So, um, you know, there are a number of uh, recent progress uh, um, after uh, what Paolo mentioned that game in uh, Go game in Seoul. Um, first, uh, a, a program that I think should get uh, should be the first uh, computer program to get a Nobel Prize. This is AlphaFold that basically solved a decade-long problem in biology, how to infer free the structure of proteins from the sequence of amino acids. And then a number of um, even more recent developments having to do with large language models um, and the ability of um, machine learning to synthesize paintings or images that are um, very good. In fact, this is, I think, a, a, uh, I, I don't remember if it was Dali or Mid Journey generated image that won an artistic prize a year ago. Um, and uh, the prompt used to generate the image is proprietary. You don't know it. The product won the first prize. And uh, um, I want to tell you about the foundations of what's going on, of machine learning, uh, the foundations of machine intelligence at this point. So why do we need a theory? Um, you know, this should have been interest to especially mathematicians, because I think uh, understanding what's going on in these machines is uh, a real, um, a real big, interesting, extremely interesting challenge, and to a good extent still open. So, um, why we need a theory? Well, one argument is um, what happened with electricity, and this is back to this Laura Norris causa you mentioned, which is was for the two hundred years was in the, the year 2000, 200 years of the anniversary of the publication and the proceedings of the Royal Society uh, by Alessandro Volta, this invention of the pila, the battery. Now, um, until Volta invented the pila, the battery, there was no continuous source of electricity. There were sparks, uh, lightnings, but no continuous source, so um, nothing really was done uh, with electricity until then. Um, he invented the PILA in order to prove that another academic colleague, uh, Galvani, was wrong. This is a typical motivation for all of us. And, uh, um, and you know, just to give you a feeling, I, I did not realize it until I visited Pisa, they had opened a museum in the meantime, it's closed about Volta and what he, happened after him about electricity in Pavia. And um, it looked like it was uh, in 1800, like little Silicon Valley of electricity. And, uh, um, you know, Volta himself designed an a telegraph line between Milan and Pavia, it was never built, but the idea of the telegraph was there immediately. And then the electrochemistry was done, and then electrical motors were built, and then electrical generators. So there were a lot of uh, progress in a few decades, um, pro pro progress in applications, um, although there was no theory. Nobody really understood what electricity was, and it was at least until Maxwell, I'm exaggerating and simplifying a bit, but till Maxwell, 1860 something, that there was a theory of electromagnetism. And then, and then of course, there were further development, radio and radar and uh, television and computers and the internet and artificial intelligence, right? So, um, so the point is that you so, sometimes have 
more or less casual discoveries like electricity, and you have a lot of interesting applications because before theory happens. So what happens now is not unusual. If we don't have yet a theory and already have a lot of applications for machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, but if we have a theory, we could do even better. Apart from understanding what's going on, from my point of view is more, even more important. Okay, so by the way, the telegraph, think about, about it is when it, Alessandro Volta invented the pillar, it was the year 1800. And until then, for millennia, forever, information traveled with the, at the speed of a horse. And then the battery comes and there are telegraph information travels at the speed of light. So just to give an idea of how, how much this changed, there are these wonderful letters when, when I mean, the, <laughs> it's a footnote, but when Constantinopolis fell to the Turks, it was 1450 something, um, more or less the year Christopher Columbus was born in Genoa, so they say, but anyway, in, uh, it was a big event in the Christianity in the Western world. And so people in Vienna wrote to each other, said, did you see, did you hear that Constantinopolis fell? And we know that from the, all these letters, the news arrived in Vienna in three weeks, four weeks to Paris, five weeks to Madrid. It's a horse running 24 hours. Yeah. So, uh, OK. Instead of six weeks, millisecond or so. So that's, uh, yeah, that's theory. And uh, um, let's see, test some. So we need that. We need a theory because we want to understand. We need a theory because we want to have a better system. Particularly now, uh, if we have a theory, a number of problems that are um, you know, important and often, uh, often discussed about AI and these uh, large language models uh, are explainability and control of what they do. If we would have a theory, they would be automatically uh, solved. Uh, that's it's funny nobody mentioned that, but uh, you know this would be a, a big step forward to make these systems more secure and more uh, widely available. Now, the reason for a theory, from my point of view, the main one would be to really, if this would give us an understanding of basic principles of intelligence that may be possibly, may be common between our own intelligence and the intelligence of systems like ChatGPT. Um, so I think uh, um, in this, in this uh, as uh, Christos Papadimitriou, a very good computer scientist wrote, in the, this, um, uh, the success of uh, transformers of large language models or deep learning in general is almost, uh, it's not just uh, uh, something that computer scientists should analyze and see how efficient the algorithm is, that's okay. But here we really need to understand what makes these things work. It's like, phenomenon in physics, what's going on? You know, these are the computer programs, they run on machines, but they produce, produce physical outputs and from input to outputs, what's going on, what makes them work. Um, so, um, so that's the challenge. And in order to give you some background of what's going on or what has happened, where we stay, what is, problems that are solved and many problems that are open. Let me give you some very brief background on a conceptual framework for machine learning that is behind all these models. So 
the, the framework is that you have an unknown mapping from an input space to an output. This is, think about especially systems like uh, convolutional networks or classifiers. You have an input, could be an image or could be something else. You have an output, which is what is in the image, for instance. And, uh, um, and so you have an unknown function from this input space to the output space. And the, in this framework, the goal is first to find a parametric approximator of the unknown function. Um, the, you want a parametric approximator, so a system, you know, the simplest one would be um, uh, parameterized linear functions. But of course, that's not powerful enough. You want an approximator that could approximate the broadest possible of nonlinear mappings from, say, a compact domain, if you want, a cross domain to an output space. And you want a parametric, a parametric approximator because then the parametric approximator the system uses are deep neural networks, where the parameters are the weights. And that you want a parametric approximator because what you want to do is once you have this general approximator, you, you can then find or hope to find the parameters by minimizing an empirical error on the training set. So that's a, a training or optimization stage. And of course, there are already a number of questions, but then, uh, then you want, uh, uh, of course, to have some guarantee about how well this uh, parametric description will do on future inputs. So that's the generalization. Um, OK, so that's broadly the framework. And uh, um, the, at, the, at the moment, we know that a powerful approximator um, is the one provided by multi-layer deep networks, which the form is that you have um, a linear transformation, so V1 is a matrix of your input as a vector, and then you have nonlinearities, the R, for instance, RLU nonlinearities, or a sigmoidal or, um, or a polynomial, uh, univariate polynomial that um, will be applied uh, component wise to the output of the linear transformation. This D1x, you can think of it as a, in the case of RLU, as a diagonal matrix where the diagonal elements are either zero or one, depending on whether um, V1 of x, the component of your one of x, is greater than zero or less than zero. That's the RLU. Uh, so you have a, a, a series of uh, parameters, um, the v1, v2, and so on, and uh, until a last layer of transformation without a nonlinear. So that's kind of pretty uh, general formulation. There are details. People sometimes use a bias term. You don't really need it, because you can always add a constant to the input vector. Uh, and that's what, that will do it. Um, and we know that, um, um, and I'll tell you in, uh, in a moment more details, but in the meantime, we know that every function that is efficiently Turing com computable, so computable in um, time that is not exponential, um, you know that that can be approximated without curse of dimensionality by approximators of this type. 
This means that um, you, in order to have an arbitrary good approximation of an unknown function, um, um, which basically needs to to be continuous and some Lipschitz continuity be defined on a compact domain that's then if it's Turing computable then can be approximated very well with a number of parameters that is not exponential in the dimensional that's a relatively new result but this essentially tells you that approximator made of deep neural networks why it turns out um, the um, weight matrices at each stage are relatively sparse. Um, can be used as approximate. Um, so this result explains why, why the depth helps essentially to avoid the curse of dimensionality. And uh, um, um, but then, so the, and why you should use um, neural networks as parametric approximators. Um, now, there are other things I'll, I'll, I'll mention. Um, the, the next stage is optimization. So you have this, uh, the first part to just justify the use of deep neural networks. Um, the, the second part is optimization, how to find the parameter. This is more open in terms of problem at this point. We don't know yet general conditions under which optimization will work. Um, but typically you will have to um, minimize uh, something which is the error of your network with respect to the true um, output for each of capital N data points, Xn and Yn. And um, in the theory we are developing, you need also the regularization term, a weight decay that keeps the norm of each weight matrix small. Thank you. Um, so this is the product of the Frobenius norms of each of the weight matrices. And uh, you typically use for doing optimization of this type, gradient descent algorithms such as stochastic gradient descent, where you are uh, sampling a random subset of the data um, and use it to approximate the gradient do gradient descent at each iteration. Um, in this particular case, um, this is stochastic, uh, stochastic gradient descent on uh, the norm, the total norm, and the normalized weight matrices. But you could do it directly on the original coordinates, which are the W matrices. Um, of which this is the normalized version. Um, we know from a number of theorems that uh, a typical shape for deep networks um, um, doing classification, like image categorization, should be a relatively large input layer followed by um, even larger in terms of units, neurons, um, RLU units, uh, second or third layer, and then um, we, we can prove that the rank um, size of this layer should decrease until a layer that has C minus one units or C minus one rank of the weight matrices where C is the number of classes. Um, but there are a number of questions about what, how, what happens during optimization. Some questions have been 
salt, for instance, uh, um, we we know that um, why overparameterization works and works well. You can have more parameters than data, and uh, still have good generalization properties. Um, and this is again, I, I may have the time to say something, but it's basically because. Um, because you have either an explicit or implicit uh, regularization. In other words, when uh, um, um, the number of parameters is not really what counts in uh, um, problem of this type for generalization, what counts is um, the, um, the some norm on the parameter. Another way to say something but I think is equivalent is what counts is not so much the number of parameters, but the number of bits that you have. And if you think about it, having larger norms allows you more bits, maybe hidden or not, in your parameterization. And so by the way, that's an interesting question itself, and we can discuss about it later. And uh, um, we also recently found some interesting differences between SGD and GD, even in the linear case. So in, in gradient descent, what you use um, in uh, when you do the descent, the gradient descent S, which is the size of the mini batch, the size that you randomly sample every time. The, so the format, the extreme format, the classical form of, of stochastic gradient descent is S as size one. You draw one point only. You compute the gradient on that point and you go on. Gradient descent, we, we use all the day add data. And, uh, you know, in this many practical system, we are speaking about millions of data points. So, uh, the case of transformer, they may be billions or more. So um, gradient descent, you would have to do one gradient step every, say, uh, one billion data point. And so that's gradient descent. You have a one billion iteration every one billion data point. Um, but so this are is the difference, but. Um, Turns out that together with the um, fact that there is a weight of decay, you have some interesting differences. One is that uh, stochastic gradient descent will be um, more noisy. There are relatively much larger fluctuations, even asymptotically at equilibrium, so to speak. And um, it will have a bias towards low rank of the weight matrices that may play a role in better generalization. Again, I'll touch on, this is a kind of a background. So let me go to some more details. In terms of approximation theory, um, what I mentioned is um, that, that since in the, in, I would say 80s, 1980s or so, uh, it was already known that uh, a network with just one hidden layer um, can approximate um, a function of uh, d variables um, arbitrarily well. Um, and this is essentially like a virus trust theorem type of result. You know, you, you can approximate uh, with a polynomial you know, almost a very reasonable function you know, on a compact domain arbitrarily well. But you may need a lot of terms. And that's the problem, is that you have a general curse of dimensionality. So, uh, and this is not, uh, it's not just an abstract curse, is that uh, suppose that um, you, you have an, a number of parameters that is epsilon to the minus d over m, where m is the smoothness of the function. So how many derivatives, how smooth it is, for instance, in a, in a Sobolev space, 
uh, this uh, dimensionality. Suppose M is one by simplicity. So, um, uh, you know, if epsilon is 10% error and uh, uh, D is 10, you have 10 to the 10, depends on number of parameters, which is big, but not so big. But if your um, the, the dimensionality is, uh, uh, say, 1,000, CIFAR images are small images, 32 by 32 pixels, that's a database of images. Um, and then you have, uh, you know, 10% error, and then 1,000, you have 10 to the 1,000. And now that's a really big number because 10 to the 80 is the number of protons in the universe. So, so this is much bigger. Um, so the curse of the nationality is real. And uh, the, the, there is a, the traditional way to try to avoid the curse of the nationality is to say, OK, I, my function is very, very smooth. And, and so if M is very, very smooth, you can counteract it. But in many cases, it's not a reasonable assumption. Um, Another way that we found a few years ago is that to assume that your function of many variables is a function of function of functions, composition of function. Um, so an example that corresponds to this one is a binary tree. This is not a neural network. This is a, the graph of a function. So each node is a function of two variables is one of these G12, G11. So here you can um, synthesize a function of as many variables as you want, uh, composing functions of two, of two variables each. And it turns out, and the proof is quite simple, is that, uh, is that for functions of this type, the curse of dimensionality, the number D, the plane, the curse of dimensionality is not the number of variables, input variables, but is the inputs to the unit with the largest number of variables. In this case, it would be two. So in this case, the curse of dimensionality is essentially goes away. In terms. Um, and so that was interesting result. But of course, the, the question was uh, how many functions, um, you know, why should we be lucky to have this function representing this unknown mapping that is, has this very nice form? It turns out, so for, for some time, I thought it was uh, perhaps uh, property of functions in physics because of local interactions and um, things like that. But it turns out, um, this is recent, that, um, that essentially all functions that are efficiently Turing computable. This means function that be, can be computable by a Turing machine. And this for many of us working with computers means all functions <laughs> we are interested in. Um, that are computable by a Turing machine in a time which is not exponential, not the age of the universe or less than that. So these functions, are all compositional spots, are all, have a representation. They may have more than one representation in general, but they have at least one representation, which is of a form um, similar, similar to this one, where the constituent function depends on a small number of, of variables. By the way, if you have a question, please interrupt. Um, so, so this means that you know, every function we are interested in, during computable in finite time, um, 
can be approximated by a network, a neural network that is sparse and deep. So in a sense, this justifies at a fundamental level why deep networks are a good thing to use. Um, does not tell you how to find the underlying graph. Um, how to find, it says, it says there is a um, the representation of this function that can be approximated very well. It does not tell you how to find it. So it exists. How to find it is in principle a problem of optimization. Um, sorry? Yeah? The finability of these funds that are corresponding to a binary tree. Do you see any advantages or do you experience any advantages in terms of the more easily trainable than a dense network or, or something? Um, so, first of all, uh, this theorem does not mean that by itself, does not mean that the binary trees could be a graph. Let's see if I, I don't have it anyway. Could be a graph which is not a binary tree, to be a directed a cyclic graph, which node that um, have a small dimensionality and a small number of inputs. Um, um, so that, that, that's the first thing. The, um, and I was saying, you know, I don't have a formal statement of this, but uh, if you think about a Turing machine, I think the extreme version of the, the underlying sparse graph would be um, a graph in which each node corresponds to a basic operation of the Turing machine, like a logical end or a logical or. So you can imagine, it could be a very deep graph, uh, but each node uh, could be made into just a, a node with one or two inputs. Essentially representing the Turing program in terms of Boolean circuits. Um, so it, this is kind of interesting also because it's mixing things so you know the, the, the result of compositional sparsity it's true for any function then uh, um, this this re result says uh, um, you know this version of the result uh, um, I should have written Turing computer but anyway this says among, among all functions, consider the ones that are Turing computable. This is a subset. And for instance, one big step in Turing computability is the ability to approximate real numbers with rational numbers, and at the end with Boolean variables. And uh, usually this can be done. But there are some examples. Um, for instance, if you want to compute the pseudoverse, it's not clear you can go from, because of the problems, uh, you, you can define it as Turing computable. Uh, you can compute it, but you cannot prove that you can maintain um, an upper bound and the lower bound in your approximation throughout the whole computation. Yeah, and you can think of, you know, in terms of programs, it's kind of a, uh, what it says is that uh, every program should be 
uh, writable in terms of much, but quite simple subroutines. So. All right. Um, so, that, that I'm repeating what I said before, uh, you know, the neural network is uh, very simple, um, parametric um, function that takes in each layer set of inputs, um, does a linear transformation, so different weights, take a sum of these weighted inputs from the layer below and then passes this number through an RLU, for instance. In the meantime, uh, people are beginning to use a more and more smooth version of the RLU, like GELUs, which are uh, like uh, the, the small gradient here, a smooth kernel and so on. Um, so that's, and as I said, the, the gradient descent means you have a loss function with this sum of, for instance, the square errors. You can define it in different way for each uh, um, examples. And, uh, and you are trying to find the set of W, which could be billions or trillions in the largest la language models um, that minimize this error. Because you are over-parameterized, you have typically more weights than, uh, um, than uh, uh, examples. Um, um, usually it's possible to find an absolute zero, so parametric function that uh, fits exactly all the data. That's uh, not necessarily true for transformers, but uh, um, it's true for other applications like ImageNet uh, classifiers for um, images. Um, and in general, the, we are doing this minimization correspond to doing <coughs> gradient descent <coughs> on a landscape of the loss, L. And this landscape as a function of the parameters in general would be very nonlinear or non quadratic in the classical. Um, So this is kind of a quick review of the situation in the optimization, which I think is the area where more open problems at the moment. We have more open problems, other ones, than uh, approximation or generalization. So in uh, it seems that uh, what I say is not a theorem, but just a mix of empirical and theoretical observation is that if I know the how the architecture of the network should be, for it's a convolutional network in which, uh, um, you see, I think I uh, uh, took it to away. Um, okay, a convolutional network in which um, each input each node, each network, each neuron, sorry, each neuron receives a small number of inputs. Um, in, uh, if I know the architecture of the network, then, uh, um, then it, it seems that uh, in, uh, I have more parameters than data. Then it seems that techniques like stochastic gradient descent find optimum, an optimum and zero loss solution of the parameters. In general, without weight decay, this uh, 
um, you know, you have a number of parameterized problems. This would correspond to uh, the case in the linear domain in which you have um, um, less, fewer equations than uh, unknowns. Um, so you can find uh, an infinite number of solutions that solve the equation. Um, in the linear case, this also corresponds to the say, case of the pseudo inverse, where you have um, a degenerate solution. You are selecting, for instance, the one with minimum norm. Um, and I think in uh, um, we have some results showing that um, in in the case of linear network, if you use if you use a weight decay. You're basically selecting the solution that corresponds to the weight matrices that of course fit the data and have minimum of their product in terms of norms. So you're looking for a solution that fit the data and where the, the product of the norms of the weight matrices is minimum. And this would exactly correspond to the pseudo inverse in the case of uh, linear problems. And in that case, you can the, the solution you find not only fits the data, but it also has good generalization. Um, in the case, there are cases where the transformer may be the situation, this is a, a conjecture that uh, um, transformers you don't have um, you don't assume uh, it's a, a convolutional architecture. Um, you have uh, a tension layer and uh, other dense RLU layer in between. And this is almost like uh, it's an architecture that can find the sparsity, the required sparsity on the fly. That's kind of, it's a conjecture, it's just a thought. I'll come back to this. Um, let's see, um, see a, a few other, um, just in terms of notation, if I call um, a rho is the product of the norms of the weight matrices, so one number, and uh, uh, V is the normalized, weight matrices, so Tobinius norm one at layer K. And these are the stochastic gradient descent equations. Um, and so the whole network can be represented as the product of rho time F, where F is the network with the normalized V. And I can do this because the RLU is homogeneous, so the RLU of, of A constant A time X is equal to A times the RLU of X. Um, so I can do this, um, and, um, and I, I have a number of results that tell me something about the loss function. Um, in general, um, if in the case of overparameterization, um, it turns out that the, the global minimum of the loss function um, is zero. Um, so, and uh, the, of course, uh, it, when I fit the data in general, and uh, um, this uh, um, global minimum is. Uh, uh, very highly degenerate. It's not surprising because I have more parameters than data. So it's like in the linear case, I really have an infinite number of solutions. The dimensionality of this manifold of global minimum is W minus N, where W is the number of parameters, N is the number of data. So th this can be a big number. For instance, for network that solve CIFAR, which is this, uh, database of small images, 32 by 32, there are 50,000 images in the training set. Um, 
since the number of parameters typically could be 200,000 or so, so I have 200,000 parameters minus 50,000. So the dimensionality of global minimum is 150,000. And um, this means, for, and among other things, that so the, the, the situation of the loss would be like a loss, can be very jagged. Then I have regions which are zero loss, that's a global minimum. Um, this is in two dimensions. So here the degeneracy in two dimensions is effectively 150,000 dimensions. And uh, the fact that it, there is so much degeneracy, it means that it's relatively uh, easy to find because it's a big volume in, in a parameter space. You can make this more precise. Um, 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 there are other results that say um, that, for instance, this degenerate minima, this global minima, uh, with sufficiently high uh, overparameterization, um, are connected. It's like the sea level at zero. It's all connected. They're not, they're not just lakes, in the, but it's a lot like the sea. Um, and then, um, yeah, this is in the case of, we don't have with the K, but it looks like a very recent result um, that if you have weight decay, um, you still have a similar situation if you have weight decay on the product of the norms. Not necessarily when you use the sum as a regularizer, which I don't think is the right thing to do anyway for other reasons. Um, so that would be a kind of topological analysis, the loss function. And um, we have some more on a recent paper um, here. Yeah, but um, in terms of generalization, uh, it turns out that um, there is a, this technique which is too uh, complicated to describe, but I'll just refer to it in the feeling, is that you can uh, bound the um, difference between the empirical error and the expected error, which means the error you're making on the training set, which could be zero, and the error you're going to make on new data. And you can bound it using a quantity called the Radamacher averages or the Radamacher numbers of a class of function, which would be, in this case, the neural network that you're using, plus some term, this is in probability. And um, it turns out that this Radamacher um, complexity of the neural networks uh, with RNU or the architecture you have um, is uh, because Radamacher is also homogeneous, you can take out the row so this is the Radamacher complexity of your networks normalized, where the weight matrix are normalized, and the row is outside. So this tells you that um, that um, the uh, this bound, uh, while you are doing the generalization, depends on rho. So this is related to what I was saying before. In the linear case, which would say, okay, if you have a pseudo inverse, many solution to the inverse problem or to, to the problem of linear problem. Um, you, if you choose the one with minimum norm, you would do better in generalization. So there are many solutions that fit the data. You want to have good generalization. You, and the same story here with respect to rho. In the linear case, of course, it's just the norm of the, uh, of the parameters of the linear parameters. Here is the product of the norm of the weight. Um, and the, and this one, um, this one, um, we don't know too much about it. But one result, the recent results, is um, that uh, um, that essentially um, the, the formal results is here. It's too complicated to read, but uh, uh, basically it says that um, if you have a weight matrix that are 
have a st structural sparsity, like you have in a convolutional network, in which essentially you have, uh, for each, think of the weight matrix in the convolutional network, like um, the triplets matrix corresponding to the convolution. So you will have, um, in the one dimensional case anyway, you have one row is the kernel, a lot of zeros. And then the row below will be the kernel now displaced by one or whatever, and a lot of zero otherwise, and so on. So it's a banded matrix with a lot of zero. Turns out that um, in the typical bounds that people derived already years ago using Radamacher, you have at some point this, this uh, um, estimate of a term which is one layer is wx, where the x is the input to the layer. And what people did usually was to uh, say, okay, I bound this by it, the norm of w times the norm of x. Of course, that's correct. But if you have this structure that I, I told you, then you can show that you can have a much better bound, which is Essentially, instead of the norm of the W, we have the norm of one row in the W. So this is can be thousand times better in practical cases we have looked at. So we we get bound that before were like uh, they should be between zero and one in a typical CIFAR network. You you get with a traditional bound you get one million. So, um, but doing this step in a tighter way gives us numbers that are close to one. So they're still loose, but you know, in a much more reasonable way. So the point here is not so much really, is that um, sparsity seems to play a role also in generalization, not only in approximation. Um, and that's nice. And uh, I expect it, they're connected, but not exactly sure why, why, so open question for anybody who's interested. Um, yeah, this is just showing practice that bounds are still loose, but they work. Okay, so these are, um, it, by the way, an interesting footnote is that from the, um, in this case, weight sharing does not really improve, improve the bounds. So what, what is important from the point of view of convolutional network is not so much the weight sharing, the fact that you have the same weight, but the fact that the, the convolutional kernel you're using is sparse, um, at least for generalization. For approximation, it's also um, is not weight sharing that gives you, um, gets rid of the exponential um, curse of dimensionality. It reduces the number of parameters, but not in an exponential way. Again, over there, what in approximation, what matters is not weight sharing, but the fact that the convolution is typically sparse. Does not need to be, but in neural network typically is just very sparse. Um, so this is um, you know, a little summary of, um, about, I think, the importance of theory, the, um, the importance of sparsity or compositional sparsity. Um, yeah, this is a, an example of a graph, which is not a binary graph, but where the number that matters from the point of view approximation in terms of dimensionality is four, because this is the node which the most. Um, and, uh, um, and then, um, you know, the, this question about transformers and, you know, depending um, what, uh, I can tell you more about transformers, so stop here and answer questions and uh, or tell you about uh, more about SGD, stochastic gradient descent, and uh, 
uh, tell me, first of all, how much time I have? Yeah. Paul. Okay. And so who wants SGD? Who wants pulse, uh, who wants transformers? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So transformers. Um, yeah, this is just to say that it used to be that there were um, basically until recently convolutional networks were really the architecture that had success, especially in images, but also text and speech. Mm -hmm. um, but then now there are these other architectures, um, like MLP mixer, uh, perceivers, and especially transformers. In transformers, um, I think in transformers you have basically an architecture which is like uh, a, an attention layer, and then two layers of RLU units, dense and then an attention layer, 10 or 20 such layers. Now, I think the main property, there are a couple of quite interesting things about this architecture. And first one is that nobody knows really why they work so well. Um, um, I don't think that is, the ultimate architecture. Personally, I would be surprised. Um, but it's still quite interesting to try to understand why they work, because this would, may tell us how to do something better. Oh. And the first point that I think is quite important, it's kind of trivial, but it is an autoregressive architecture. So, um, so you are you have as input one token, one word, or a few, and you are trying to predict the next word, and then you go on. Okay, so it's a little bit like if you have uh, it's a little bit. Uh, first of all, you don't need uh, to have labeled data. That's very important because the data themselves are the target, give, give you the target, just from past world, future world. So you have everything. That's very important because you can use giant um, data sets. Um, right now we are in terabyte range. Um, uh, the other one is uh, this autoregressive architecture. So um, it's like it's a somewhat of a metaphor or analogy, but it's like you have a deep network, um, but instead of having input and output and five layers in between, it's it's more like you have a deep network, but you know what the output of each layer, right? Much easier to learn. For each word or past words, you have next and so on. It would be extremely more difficult if you have the first word or the last one, and you have to predict the last one, you know, 10,000 words later. So autoregressive is important. And in fact, um, um, this is, again, a compositional function, if you want. You have, uh, you can think of uh, uh, what goes on as the composition of several functions if you learn each one. Um, um, now, um, 
So this is this analogy of with uh, multi-layer networks. So in a, in a multi-layer network, it would be it's difficult to have input and predict the output. It's much easier if you could learn each each layer at a time. And transformers, because of the the task, the sequence of tokens and predicting the next token is more much more like predicting one layer at a time. Um, so um, um, in fact, there is this result by Eran Malak that says for any computer program essentially, um, there exists a data set such that um, I can learn um, the in this autoregressive way, the, the learning the next item I can learn. It is a positive statement. So suppose that uh, everything on the internet is produced by a program on a Turing machine. Then and suppose I have available uh, the input and output of steps of the Turing machines, Man, many examples of individual steps, then I can learn the program. And this says both approximation and optimization are possible, are doable. In fact, you learn every time a linear process. And right now we are doing some experiments that suggest you can replace the old transformer by a decision tree, uh, which is a very old technique in uh, classification and regression. And it seems to, it works reasonably well on some simple data set. So this, this essentially says that one of the main secrets of transformer is this autoregressive nature. Okay, so that's one. Um, the other one is self-attention. So essentially, um, um, this is the, 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 the machinery that essentially um, take a tokens, and I need to bring the next one, take a tokens, and then selects which other preceding tokens to use. Principle, you should use all of them, but this will give you too many variables. So again, this is something trying to find a sparse representation. And does that by doing something simple, which probably, probably works, but uh, quite likely there is, you could do something better because what it's doing is just looking for tokens that are um, most similar to the tokens you're looking in almost a um, dot product type uh, operation, uh, just most similar in uh, as a scalar product. And so it's using a linear combination of the tokens that I'm sitting on and some of the previous ones, the ones that are selected by a touch. Um, okay, and you know, to give you, this is a conjecture, but in, in uh, the case of convolutional network or convolutional like, I know, I assume in the architecture itself, I assume and hardwire this hypothesis that each unit, RLU unit, is just receiving input to a small number of, say, pixels in the image or inputs. So I have a sparsity is pre-wired. Pre okay. In the case of a transformer, the conjecture is that for each RLU unit, I have an attention unit, which is, um, let me look at this one, 
which is taking in one input um, and looking and all other ones and selecting a small number, the ones most similar. So it's like an operation of choosing a sparse set of inputs, but in a flexible way, depending on the input instead of hardwired, like in the convolutional case. Um, I don't know if this is exactly what happens. Um, but as I said, it seems to be, but. Um, okay, so let me, let me stop here, I think, and, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, let me ask you whether you have any question. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so Poggio, any question here or online? In the meantime, that maybe someone thinks, I, I have a curiosity or a question. So in the optimization, let's say part of the talk, you show that actually there is a lot of space to land on a local meaning, which is quite scary because <laughs> obviously uh, there may be so multiple, uh, let's say options of uh, trained the networks with very different weights. Uh, do you have any insight of uh, what we can, uh, let's say, expect from their behavior? So is, is this an issue in the, let's say, informatics community, computer science community? Well, uh, so the, um, there are some good arguments to, to think that the global minimum is, uh, um, if you are over-parameterized, uh, occupies a very large volume. So that means that, um, you know, this, so what does that mean? Is that, for instance, if you think of stochastic, just for simplicity, of stochastic gradient descent is something similar to a diffusion process. So like Langevin type equation, where you have um, some Brownian motion driving the dynamical system, and you have as, um, you know, potential energy potential, this loss function is a very degenerate uh, minimum, global minimum. Then you, you can use um, Boltzmann equation and you find that the probability for diffusion to converge to this very degenerate minimum is very, very high. We have done some experiments where we had, uh, you know, created the loss function, you have. Uh, the local minima, for instance, in one dimension, you have a local minima, and then you have a more degenerate one at the same depth. And if you uh, run stochastic gradient descent, or you have something like I just described, you find the probability to land in the degenerate one is higher, but you find there is a significant probability for both. You go to four dimension, and the probability to land in the non-degenerate, let's call it local minimum. Now, it's equally, it's not locally in the sense it's also same level, it's equally deep, but it's, not, it's instead of being in flat in four dimensions, it's flat in one dimension. Mm -hmm. And the difference, you don't see the, the, low, the low dimensional one anymore. You never end up, you always end up in the in the, the global minimum. So I think here the generacy due to over parametrization helps good. you a yes. lot. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Other comments or questions? Please. Yes. Thank you very much for the very interesting uh, question. Uh, I, I, I have to talk. I do have a questions. Uh, so it's more on uh, constructive results. Yeah. So uh, uh, if, if the, the main uh, take home message is that the sparsity plays a role in uh, try to provide a theoretical framework on 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 uh, uh, the, the 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 results so is there a way or is do, do you foresee some room for 
how to uh, drive in a constructive way how the sparsity uh, should be taken into account. And then I have a second uh, question more from uh, the numerical analyst point of view. So is there any uh, stability result? So if I have a set of uh, data and then I perturb them a little bit, how this influence the very nice uh, theorems uh, you, you presented? Thank you. Yeah, good question. What, um, so we, we have not looked at uh, how to force sparsity. I think this is especially interesting in the case of optimization. There are some empirical results that um, suggest, uh, for instance, that if you have a dense network, you say you are uh, looking at uh, uh, classification of CIFAR image. So with a convolutional network doing quite well, you now try a dense network optimize parameters you find it does not do well at all um, but then you force sparsity by having an l1 regularizer in uh, your loss function the one you use for optimization and then you find something similar to the convolution not as good but so there may be effectively a way to help optimization finding a sparse uh, solution. Um, we have not explored that. Um, I think from the point of view of um, optimization to using L1 is uh, probably dangerous. It's not the right thing because um, they are getting into some kind of details. In this network, it turns out that um, you cannot start your optimization process from zero weight matrices. Because if you start from zero, there is no output. You're, you're, you're stuck. So you have to start, and typically people do, from matrices that uh, typically have a small norm, but are random. Th this essentially ensures that, um, at least at the beginning of the process, you go from input to, to output. You, you can actually have uh, techniques like gradient descent that are measuring how well you are doing um, that work, right? And now, I think if you are using too aggressive L1 optimization or similar, then you may um, break some of the weights that may, you are committing too early to some weights being zero. L2, of course, uh, when a parameter a weight is uh, um, uh, dec decreasing, it never decreases to zero because it's always proportional to its size. Um, so I don't know, maybe a mix of the two uh, could be, and the empirical effect that I was mentioning it was a mix of the two. Now, the other question what about stability. I've always been interested in stability, and there is one result that suggests that, in a sense, stability and generalization are very closely connected. So, and it's not too surprising. It's like um, you want a, an algorithm that, um, if you're suppose you're trying to predict whether the stock market tomorrow is going up or down and you're putting one billion of your money on it, you want to have a guarantee that if the regress of the inputs you put in um, would change a little bit, the prediction would be the same because you know there could be noise in uh, in your inputs, right? So that's stability. And it turns out that if you have this property, you can also generalize why. I can I can tell you the theorem. So I, I think um, I think some of the results about generalization that I showed you probably imply stability in, in that sense. 
other comments or questions from online? Okay, so just if that, uh, the case, we have a coffee break. No, there is a question. Yeah, uh, just a quick thing. Uh, ciao, Tommy. Um, yeah. Always nice to listen to these talks. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, all the reasoning about um, the um, sparse compositional functions uh, that may not be known a priori, which is the optimal one for a given problem, I'm wondering if it is related somehow to the winning lottery ticket uh, hypothesis. Because it seems that uh, after training a network, we can find uh, a sparser subnetwork that uh, when trained from scratch can achieve the same uh, the same performance as the original network. So it kind of seemed like a related concept. I was wondering if you thought about it or if uh, there is any connection. I'm not sure I understood. Did you repeat the question? Yes. Uh, sorry. Can you repeat the question a little uh, bit yeah, more yeah. clearly and uh, I mean maybe in a more kind of uh, synthetic way? Louder. Sure. And louder. <laughs> yeah. I was. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering about uh, if there was any connection between uh, uh, sparse compositional networks uh, in the, this framework uh, and uh, the winning lottery ticket hypothesis. And uh, the lottery ticket oh. hypothesis. Oh. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, good question. So the lottery is one of the um, um, it's not the hypothesis itself, but one of the um, practical consequences, I think, is that uh, you can uh, prune a network from the small weights and uh, in a way that does pruning and uh, training and iterations of that, in a way that uh, the network will now be much more sparse and the performance in terms of generalization remains about the same. So let me address just this corollary of the, um, uh, of the hypothesis. And in this case, um, I think uh, uh, it says that you can have sparse or sparser network doing pretty well. So it's consistent with the sparsity idea. Uh, and the fact that you can prune is simply the fact that uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm, it is the fact that the L2 regularizations or the square or, or, or similar does not eliminate uh, small weights by itself. Um, but from the point of view of this theorem I mentioned about uh, the Radamacher bound, you don't strictly need sparsity on the convolution kernel. You just need very small norm. When I say zero, you know, it's a triplet matrix with many zero. Instead of the zero, you put some very small epsilon and uh, it still works. And so, um, so from this point of view, it's certainly consistent with that uh, result that having um, this very small weight, you can put them to zero or to epsilon, and you have similar performance in, in generalization. Thank you. One last question here. Since you mentioned, since you mentioned the Radamacher uh, yeah. bound, uh, and I was thinking about it, I don't see what well, can, can you go back to the slide where, where you yeah. were showing it to us? And very simple minded question, but uh, where is the variability of where is the variability of y given x playing a role in the in the in the bound? Because here you're bounding the error that you make with g, if I understand it correctly. Yeah. Uh, by using g as an approximator of f. Right, and so you are bounding it, taking into account data because your L hat of G could be zero because you could have you could have a perfect interpolator. Yeah, uh, but I still don't see where the irreducible variability of Y given X uh, plays a role here, unless you think that given the X, the Y is fixed. Well. Um... No, why um, given x the conditional probability is not is not generate so, right? Yeah. So what, 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 so I do see I do see the m I do see the 
the, the sample size. Uh, and the row is connected to the, 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 the Frobenius norm of, of your linear operators. But yeah, uh, uh, it's really the N, um, you know, this was the, the randomness is el eliminated right. when N goes to infinity. Okay. So the, but still, you, it's, it looks like if you are able to reduce rho, it looks like you are able to approximate. Well, it depends. Independently okay. on the variability, on the irreducible variability of y given x. Um, yeah, but rho cannot be zero, of course. No. And uh, this uh, rather marker of the normalized network also cannot be too small. Okay, so I think um, the row, the Radamacher of f takes into account the variability of y given x. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I have to look at, into it. Thank you very much. This is assuming ignorance. Okay. So uniform distribution. Yeah. You could you could do better if you take into yeah. it, if you have some knowledge. Right. Uh, <clears throat> I was wondering if there is a connection between uh, the sparsity that you have mentioned and the uh, interpretability, since uh, most of the architecture that uh, are used for uh, developing interpretable uh, network are based on um, generalized additive model or neural additive model. So yeah, is there a connection between yeah, I think so. Um, you know, for instance, if you um, um, I mean, if you'd have uh, um, all all the steps in a you know Turing program that corresponds to it, you could, in principle, describe it. Now, whether in practice this work, another example: if you if we have um, you know, in decision trees, you have essentially, um, again, it's similar to, um, to a spline description of a function. You say this variable is between 0 0.6 and 0 0.7, then, you know, I go through this uh, uh, branch of the tree, and then I may have some other criterion. So, it is a description, a more explainable description, description in terms of rules of what's going on. I think that should be more interpretable than what we have now with RLU units. And, um, whether it, it's sorry, explainable machines. Explainable boosting machine. Yeah. So, so user or boosting machines similar to what you are. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, you know, this this one. I mean, we have tried. We this is another. We have empirically we have replaced a very unit in a transformer, the attention unit and the MFT, the RLU units, with uh, essentially radial basis function units, a Gaussian. Uh, and this is more like um, uh, like um, like nearest neighbor, if you want. And uh, we thought maybe we can explain it better what's going on. And this is true for the first layer, but it became much more difficult for the other layers. But part of the problem, this is specific to transformers, is that you are not looking at the tokens themselves, but you have embeddings. So vectors, high dimensional vectors, like uh, 700 or 1,000 corresponding to each token. And when you have mixture of those, interpreting what the input is, especially at higher level in the network, becomes complicated. I'm not saying it's impossible. Have not, people have not found yet a good way to do it.
Thank you very much. I think it's time to stop this very nice discussion and move to a coffee break where the discussion can continue. Thank you very much again. Thank, Thank you so much.